is spreading her wings. And you can see his hair wild. King would use in ancient time. And all of them drop dead, as you can see. Deceased king. That's the main purpose of all the funeral temples. Most of, or most of the bylaws ruined here, so there's very little remaining from the bylaws. But also, it's the only temple provided with a with a royal residence, a royal residence or a royal palace, different to all other temples. Which is we're going to see right behind this temple. Shall we get inside yes. and start? With seeing the royal palace of Ramses the Third, beautiful statue for that segment. Statue made of basalt. It's a very precious stone, and this is. A very famous statue in ancient Egypt for God's sake. If you've been to Karnak at the Open Museum, there are a big collection of Sekhmet statues. Oh, Did okay. you see in Karnak? Then? Yes. You remember? Yes. Yeah. You visited the Open Museum yep. now? Ongoing work of restoration. Oh, wow. For a shrine which was completely ruined. This is of my birth like this. So wherever you go, wherever you go in any temples, you will see mud bricks walls like this. And it was a fence. Big fence, always, always about 12 meters wide and oh, wow. 20 meters high. Jeez. And the same time was used as highways or high ramps to transfer all the big stones to build bylaws like this and to fix obelisks. So that was the main purpose of erecting highways of mud bricks. Wherever you go, you always see them as the Ministry of Antiquities left it purposely for the tourists to see, to oh, understand. Cool. But in ancient time, after they finish the work, they would remove it. Oh, really? So once they finish building the pylon, pylon they would remove it. This is why at Karnak, there are highways in each side of the pylons, the right and the left-hand side. And when you get inside, right behind, there is a, a, a big lot or a, a big pile of mud bricks right behind the bylon. Yeah. Do you remember in yes. Karnak Timber? Again, it was used as a highways to transfer all the materials you used to erect bylons. And a very similar scenery here for king hitting the enemies and give it as an offering in front of God Amun Ra. God Amun Ra was known with the two feathers crown. Okay, yeah. Very famous with the two feathers crown. All the, all the writings is depicting the victory of the king.
time of the convoy. Okay. This is the way of Dallas. An ongoing uh, excavation and ongoing restoration inside the temple. Because there are people there and they should. We are going to see the most beautiful scenery here inside this temple. The most beautiful scenery showing us thing hunting. Wow, look how big those are. One of the stuff ancient Egyptian used called the Haya, and it was used for grinding wheat. This is how you grind wheat. Wow. You used to have like a hand in here, hand, and the Egyptian would keep turning it round and round, and the wheat would be grinded under. Cool. Until today, Egyptian used the same thing. Wow. So if you go to an Egyptian house, in a farmer house, a proper farmer house, you would see the same thing. This is how they would make, uh, they would make wheat or would make, would grind wheat so they could use it for feed instead of, instead of rice. So a very old way of eating wheat, very oh. ancient way and it carried on until today. Very cool. A very beautiful scenery behind you for the king while hunting. So you're seeing him, he's in his chariot, hunting all the animals. And he's also fishing. So you're seeing some fish down there. So he's carrying out some sport. He's hitting the enemies of him. He's pulling them from their hair. And hitting them with the other hand. And again, a very similar scenery here is the size of this little shrine. All this beautiful shrine was beautifully engraved and colored, beautifully decorated. But most of the colors faded and ruined, unfortunately. Each little shrine oh, was decorated with beautiful statues, and most of the statues, unfortunately, stolen. Ah. Oh. This is the Royal Palace. Why the Royal Palace is divided is one of the oldest or the oldest tourists in the world. The oldest tourists in the world. I think it's there. Shall we have a look at it? There, please. Most of the balance is ruined, as you can see, so there is just space in here. Yeah, that's the tool that King would use in ancient time. If you walk inside, oh. you see how it looks. Oh wow. Somebody does something in it. <laughs> wow. This is the oldest toilet in the world. The last of the oldest toilet in the world. That's crazy. I'm telling you to keep a royal palace behind the temple line. Very. Most of the world. Especially the outfall of the outside of the world used to show victory of the king, to show the king as victorious. Always used to record the fights against the enemies and the victory of the king. That's like a very old tradition and ritual for all kings done it the same way. They all, they all recorded the victory on the walls of the temple. Okay, we're gonna get inside the temple now. Okay. This is the part 
in, in writing here as a very usual way of writing would have been more of a more of a uh, outer engravings than inside. Oh, okay. This is engraved right in. Okay, because they have the, they have learned the lesson from the past when most of the drawings ruined easily or been destroyed and damaged easily. But by by carving it in like this would be very very difficult to be damaged by another king. Okay. Yeah, because oh, because they can't example, come and chip yeah. out the faces yeah. and stuff. Because he've learned the lesson. Ramses the second and Ramses the third learned the lesson. They've done it themselves. There was a time when they, when they changed names of other kings and they put their names in the state. Oh they wow! Some changes, and they've done it easy. But they thought we don't want this to happen to us <laughs> from the next generation or from the next king. Right. So they changed the technique. Wow. By carving it very, very deep in. So the start of this art was from the time of Ramses II, which is the 19th dynasty. But before this, all the engraving was carved out. And I'm sure you've seen all of this in Luxor Temple. Right. Yeah. So smooth. Crazy. For context, look at this. Look how tall this wall is. Crazy. Here we go. The king and his wife in front of Horus and Amon Ra. Askadeh Ra, next to him got Horus, and in the front is the king leading them to the eternal house or houses of eternity. So he's taking them from their hands and telling them enter the eternal houses. Another scenery of there for King in front of Osiris. So we see in the body in a mummified form. Oh, wow. You see it on the right hand side? Yeah. That's, that's a representation of God Osiris. This is God Osiris in front of King of Egypt, Ramses of the Seraph. Hmm. Many of the scenery is unfortunately chiseled down. We don't know 100% who chiseled the past. We know a touch or twine ago that most of the engravings of Hatshepsut was chiseled up by Tuhatlus the same because he was excluded from power for more than 30 years by hair. But going around temples, you see many engravings chiseled up not for Hatshepsut, for other kings. And that leads you to think who chiseled it up. That doesn't mean or lead you to saying that whoever chiseled Hashishu, whoever chiseled Hashishu, doesn't necessarily believe, doesn't have to believe that what was the same. Because you're seeing many other monuments chiseled up by, or many other monuments for other kings was chiseled up. And there's always changes in Sigiri. So there's a new Sigiri Say is that wasn't Hatshepsut, wasn't Tukhatmuz the Seer who ruined Hatshepsut monuments and damaged their monuments. This is, uh, this was, uh, this wasn't a correct Siyeri. So a new Siyeri came to say a great king like this won't do something silly and stupid like this. Uh -huh. Especially it was against religion. It's against religion to destroy the ancestor monuments. Hmm. So New Sierra came up and cancelled everything was not. Mm. 
will always be new to you as it comes up, changes, changes. Ramses standing in an Azorian bush chair. Ramses standing in an Azorian bush chair, and an Azorian bush chair represents God of Death in ancient Egypt. Represent God of Death. Here is Ramses hitting all the enemies, killing thousands and thousands of them. Did you see it? He's in his chariot, killing all the enemies, hitting them with his arrow. Oh, wow. And they all fall in the path all over the place. Again, the king has to be shown very victorious. Now look at the color in there. King here in front of Damon Rock and Mot. And Mot wearing the red crown. Mot wearing the red crown of Egypt. As we know, Egypt had many crowns. Egypt had the white crown, Egypt also had the red crown, and had the double crown. White and red represent south and north, and the double crown represent all of Egypt. the two lands together. And crowns change depending on the change of festivities. So say there is a celebration uh, on the north, the king would wear the north crown. Celebration at South, he would wear South crown. And in some festivals, he would wear the double crown to show that he is the master of the two lands. He's the master of the two lands. And in the other hand, he is carrying a hammer, and with the hammer, in the other hand, he's pulling all the hairs of the enemies and he's hitting them. The king has to be shown powerful and strong to threaten all other nations around him. So that doesn't mean it's something negative in ancient time. It has to show power, to show control to the countries around Egypt. So these sceneries is a, a representation of power and strength of the king. And it's such a threat to whoever think of invading Egypt or or uh, or uh, people. Uh, revoluting on the borders oh, wow. and it's a threat to anybody who would do anything bad any anybody would would be guilty would do anything uh, makes him guilty he will end up like this so this is such a threat all the pillows made to look like a papyrus flower papyrus flower. All the pillars represent a bunch of papyrus flower tied together five times. Ah. With a crown, sometimes it's open and sometimes closed. So this is a, this is a noble crown. Each pillar represents a bunch of flower tied together five times with a noble crown and sometimes a closed crown. We have a very different architect from one temple to another. And behind you is a different kind of architect altogether. This is a rectangular pillar, very similar to the one you've seen at Hatshepsut Temple. A rectangular pillar. Perfume, sir. That's an Israel's perfume. 
an evil rock holding the stick of power. Such good color. Beautiful color, yeah. All the colors original. And the ceiling decorated with uh, goddess Nechbet. Goddess Nechbet always seen on the ceiling of temples. Oh. Always decorating the ceiling of temples. Yeah. And the ceiling of tombs. And the ceiling of shrines. So wherever you go, you're going to see the same goddess, goddess Nechbet, always on the ceiling, like this, spreading her wings. And this represents protections to the monuments. Goddess protecting the monuments of the pharaohs. Most scenery here showing the offerings of the king to the god of the Egyptian Empire. Here is beautiful sceneries for king in front of Osiris, king in front of Amon Ra, king in front of Goddess Maut, king in front of all different deities, all different Egyptian deities. Here is again a similar sceneries for king in front of Amon Ra at the bottom, and top king in front of Goddess Maut, and the third one king in front of goddess Ma'at, the goddess of truth in ancient Egypt, the one right on top. Can you see that one right on top? King in front of goddess Ma'at, offering the virus flowers. How do we know Ma'at? With the two feathers, with the two feathers on top of her hair, on top there, two yeah. feathers. And the two feathers represent truth and justice in ancient Egypt. She is known as Goddess Ma'at, the goddess of truth and justice in ancient Egypt. So all the scenery is shown king at the presence of the Egyptian deities, giving the offerings to them and receive the blessings. The ceilings here, again, decorated with beautiful stars and beautiful blue colors, as you can see. With two holes each side, used to have a ceiling. Some of the ceiling still there, and bars of it fell down, as you can see. Oh, wow. Uh. <coughs> Decorated with some beautiful colors. And again, more scenery showing the king at the presence of the Egyptian deities. Let's get a closer look to the scenery here. sitting in his chariot here in front of the Egyptians, uh, Egyptian leaders and uh, Egyptian commands who are leading the Egyptian empire coming in front of the king giving all the offerings to him, showing loyalness and You look here. These are all the people coming from different nations in front of the king, giving the offering with an inscript writing down all the offering getting offered in front of the king. One of the most beautiful sceneries inside this temple. People coming from all over Egypt and all the leaders and the commands of the Egyptian empire coming in front of the king with the offerings. And here, all the enemies of Egypt were killed, killed by Ramses. So you're seeing them, they all split all over the place and all of them drop dead, as you can see. <laughs> Very 
similar scenery to what we've seen here is king in front of Horus in the middle, king in front of Mot, king in front of Goddess Ma'at, Goddess of Truth and Justice, on top, right on top, in her human form. There are more scenery here where you could take some footage. And here is people in front of the pharaoh's horse. Reining the horse and feeding it and making it return to the horse. Here is king in front of Osiris. Temple, the holy of the holy, the most sacred part of the temple, where is the sacred boat of Gadamon Ra would be right in the middle of the temple. And unfortunately, here most of the shrines are ruined with very little remains. Dalmelawana. <laughs> So if you like to take some pictures here around here. Okay. Salam alaikum. Well, the fact that there's any color at all is pretty impressive.
So all the walls around us will be colored and decorated in the same way. No one bit of this will be colored. This round would have been every single color, sir. Come here in the sheet. Yeah. Faultless. Yeah. Absolutely faultless. Wow. So all scenery is here again, showing King giving the offerings in front of God. And God holding the stick of power here. And the King carrying some beautiful offerings on his hand. Here is the king in front of God Khnum. God Khnum, God of creation in ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. But this is a form of two gods. God Khnum, known with a two horn and a head of a sheep. But also, it represents God Amon Ra as God Amon Ra, one of God Amon Ra forms, is the head of a sheep. So a head of a sheep or a sheep represent Amon Ra. So here is king in front of Amon Ra in his animal form. In his animal form. As Amon Ra has many forms. Sometimes you see him in the form of a duck. Sometimes you see him in the form of a scarab. Sometimes you see him in the form of Kamut F, which is God of fertility. So you always see him, you always see him with his male bark. Oh, yeah. Male bar tab. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you. And that represents God of fertility in ancient Egypt. And uh, it's known as Kamut F, which means the bull of his mother. The bull of his mother. As a bull is uh, a kind of an animal, would represent fertility. Because it's a very strong animal when he attend with a, when the animal attend with a female. And this is why uh, Amon Ra, one of Amon Ra forms, is Kamut If, which means the ball of his mother. The ball of his mother hmm. represents God of fertility. Okay. And finally, the sheep represents Amon Ra too. The mouse ritual. So you're seeing uh, God holding the key of life and with the key of life in front of the nose of the king, or in front of the mouse of the king, wishing him an eternal life and wishing him eternity. And here is a very similar scene here right for God Amon Ra holding the key of life in front of the face of the king. Very similar today to the high priest or to the priest when they baptize the newborn child. Always high priest would stand on the cross, with the cross in front of the child face like this. Did you, did you notice that? Mm -hmm. High priest always carry the cross in front of the child when he get baptized. And that is originally taken from here. Huh. Even this ant size looking very similar to the cross. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it carries the same meaning, which means eternity. Why is he also carrying it? Carrying it can only kings carry keys of life. Okay. It is a symbol of eternity. They would live forever. They are kings who would live forever. So they are the only ones who would carry keys of life. It's a symbol of eternity. Yeah, they're right. <laughs> Absolutely right. Well, until today, they are the most famous. It feels as if they are alive. Yeah. And calling these houses the houses of eternity, they weren't wrong. At all. Because for thousands of years, again, it still existed here. Right. And in such good condition. And yeah, not so bad, considering three and a half thousand years old. No kidding.
This is the king on the boat here crossing in the afterlife. The afterlife journey called the afterlife journey. And I will show you something very beautiful here. This temple was used in the Coptic years for worshiping. It was used for worshiping. All Copts lived inside these temples in Coptic years. For example, Hatshepsut Temple, known today as Deir el Bahad, which means the northern monastery, because it was used as a monastery in the Coptic era. Not just Hatshepsut, any temple in Egypt was used as a place of worshiping in the Coptic years. Even this temple. So if you look here, you will see a Coptic cross. Oh, yeah. Can you see the Coptic cross? Yeah. There? Very similar to what I have. I'm a Copt. And mm. all Copts cross crossed like this. And this is known as the Coptic Cross. Some beautiful colors here, original. And here all the names of the king and Khartouches. And you know Khartouche is where yeah. the name of the king would be written. Very cool. Okay. Of offering. 
senses and bear fruit as a form of offering. And there is a beautiful scenery for Goddess Nechbet. The Goddess who would decorate the ceiling of the temples and tombs, spreading her wings for protection. Here is Timur sitting in the throne, holding the key of life. Behind him, Buddhist mode. And here we see Ramses the second giving an offering a fair Ramses is in front of Amor and behind him God Tahut. God Tahut is God of writing in ancient Egypt. He's God of writing in ancient Egypt. One of the most famous gods in ancient Egypt, a god who always be seen at the court of justice. At the last stage, with the king standing in front of God in his admission, the court of justice, where you will see the very famous scenery of weighing the hearts. And on the two scales, you will see the feathers of justice. So you always see that about writing all the admissions, writing everything down, everything is said. But also that the book is the same God who would write the name of the king during the crowning process. So you always see him writing the name of the king on the ashy tree's roots. That is God the whole God of Art in religion. Amazing. Seeing Buddhist Buddhist Techbit again, decorating the lantern of this beautiful shrine, and would have been decorating all the sea rooms. And unfortunately, most of the time fell down. You would imagine this place would have been closed with big doors here. So you can see at the two edges where the two wood oh, where wow. the wooden door would be fixed. Wow. And it would have been very dark. And for this they cut a very little hole up there to give it this little regulated light. Wow. As we are standing in one of the most sacred places in the temple. Wow. And for this place to have a divine atmosphere, it wouldn't have needed too much light. So a very little light like this to give it the divine atmosphere and the divine feel. What's what's going on here with the this would be some damage. Would have been nothing here except some damage and later on be some engravings. Oh okay. Uh, would would have happened in different times or in different years and different civilizations. Okay. We had so many civilizations came after Phonic civilizations who would make use of all temples. I see. So the original ceiling wouldn't look like that, would have been a flat ceiling. Okay. So something happened afterwards through different civilizations. We had Greek civilization, Roman civilization, Coptic civilization. So this could have been engraved in one of these eras. Okay. Thank you. It is a beautiful statue, which is hard to fit really, unfortunately. Be the king holding the stick of power. Holding the holy, the, the sacred book that will write in the middle. The snakes represent Goddess Wyatt, Goddess of Protection, and wearing 
the double crown of Egypt. This is the double crown of Egypt. Well, this is the red one. And the seat under represents the white crown. This is the this is the white the white crown and this is the red crown. So this is the double crown. So Goddess Waget wearing the double crown of Egypt and in the middle is the cartouche of the king topped with the sun disk which is a representation of God as the king represents God on earth. King represents God on earth. The statue of God Sechmet, head of a cat, top to the sun disk. Next to it, God, God uh, Horus, God Horus, and behind it is God is married, who is a God Horus holding a stick of power in front of on his hand in front of King Ramses. And King Ramses giving the offering in front of the Egyptian gods. God of mummification, oh, cool. Anubis, God of mummification in ancient Egypt, the head of a jackal. And also he is up there wearing the white crown in front of Goddess Isis. Goddess Isis. Which is very similar to Goddess Hathor. Known with the two horn and the sun disk in the middle, represent Goddess Hatko.
Now we're gonna head to the next site. Okay. okay.